What is clean coat? All right, who knows who this guy is? Grady Booch. What a great name. If your name is Grady Booch, everybody knows your name because who wouldn't know that name? Oh, that's not Grady Booch. That's Yarnus Tristrup. Sorry. I picked up, I did the wrong slide. This is Yarnus Tristrup. Who knows who that is? He's Danish. Does that matter? I guess not. Okay, so Yarnus Tristrup. And who is he? C++. He made the language C++. That's correct. So I wrote to Yarna. I said, Yarna, what does clean code make, uh, mean to you? And he said, and this is, this is very typical of Yarnus Tristrup. He said, I like my code to be elegant and efficient. And then he said this, clean code does one thing well. One thing well. Now, this one thing idea has been around in software for 40 years or more. People are always writing about how a function should do one thing and one thing well. It's a very, very old idea, and Strustrup echoes it here. But what does one thing mean? It seems to be a kind of subjective, subjective measure. What does it mean for a function to do one thing? Well, I think I know the answer to this, and I'll tell you a little bit later. I think I have a completely objective way to measure one thing. And if you, if you adhere to that objective way, it transforms the structure of your code remarkably. There's Grady Booch. I knew he was in there somewhere. Grady Booch, the chief scientist at Rational. He wrote a book in 1988 called Object-Oriented Software Design with Applications. Anybody read that book? 1980s, late 80s? Do we have anybody who was born then? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so that's fine. Fascinating book, very early book on object-oriented design. Grady Booch is also um, the first person, I believe, to have the title chief scientist. I think he invented that. Uh, and Rational said, yeah, you can be the chief scientist. That's fine. And ever since then, everybody's wanted to be a chief scientist at some company somewhere. So I asked Grady, you know, Grady, what's clean code? He said, clean code is simple and direct. Fine. And then he said this, clean code reads like well-written prose. Have you ever read code? that read like well-written prose? What does that mean, well-written prose? Now, I think I know what that means, and I think I can show you what that means. As we go along, I think I can tell you what code that reads like well-written prose means. And let's go to Michael Feathers. Michael Feathers. I wrote to Michael, I said, hey, Michael, what's clean code? And he said, clean code always looks like it was written by someone who cares. What a lovely statement. That's a, a good attitude right there. Clean code always looks like it was written by someone who cares. When's the last time you read a module and your thought as you were reading that module was, the author cared about me. The author cared about everybody else who was going to be reading that code. When's the last time you had that experience? The author of this code cared about me. Very interesting. And by the way, it brings up a fascinating point. What's your job? You may think that your job is to get code to work. That's not your job. That's only half of your job, and it's the least important part, half of your job. The more important part of your job is that you must write code that other people can maintain, can use, can make work. If you hand me code that works perfectly, but I can't understand it, then as soon as the requirements change, that code is useless. On the other hand, if you give me code that does not work, but I can understand it, I can make it work. It is much more important that your peers be able to understand the code you write than that the computer can understand the code that you wrote. It is more important to communicate with your peers using a programming language than it is to communicate with the computer. Because if you do that well, somebody will make it work. The last one, Ward Cunningham. Who knows who Ward Cunningham is? Anybody heard the name? Yeah, you know who that is, man. A few of you do. So, no, you'll know who he is as soon as I tell you. He's the guy who invented the wiki. Who's used the wiki? Everybody puts their hand up. Okay, good. Ward Cunningham is the guy who invented the wiki. He, he invented the wiki out of 19 lines of Perl in 1990-something or other, uh, put it up on the, on the website. By the way, that very first wiki is still alive. You can get to it if you want to. The URL is c2.com. The letter C and the digit 2.com, that is the very first wiki ever. It's still there, and by the way, it's full of fascinating stuff. You'll see all kinds of design pattern stuff and extreme programming stuff and agile stuff because it was there at the beginning. And I asked Ward, Ward, what's clean code? And he said this, you know you're working on clean code when each routine you read turns out to be pretty much what you expected. When's the last time you read code? And as you're reading it, it was pretty much what you expected. You're reading along and you're going, yeah, yes, yep, mm -hmm, yep, yep, yes, mm -hmm, yep, yep. When's the last time you had that experience? What he's saying is no WTFs per minute, zero. Clean code is no surprises, no WTFs. Everything is pretty much what you expected. That's good clean code. And that's what we're going to pursue over the next few hours. Now I want to go to a different part of this presentation. Let me just cycle up here. 
Now, I've been preaching for a while now. I think we've got um, a little bit of time left. I think I'd go till 10.45 if I remember correctly. So we've got enough time for this. That's good. I am going to put some code on the screen. It'll be three pages of code. I will give you one minute per page. The last page is half a page, so you'll get two and a half minutes. The code is Java. If you're a C-sharp programmer, you won't be able to tell the difference because they're the same language. Read the code, figure out what it does, and then when we're done, I'll ask you what it does. And we will begin now. What did that code do? What's that? A good, it generates HTML. And you knew that because the very last line was <laughs> get HTML. Good. What was the name of the function? Testable HTML. Good. So we got the first line and the last line. What did the middle do? <laughs> so some of you may have gotten the idea. Let me, uh, let me just walk you through it. I'm not going to walk you through the whole thing. I'll just tell you what it does. This is a little bit of code in a, in a tool called Fitness. Fitness is a wiki. Some of you may have noticed that it was a wiki. Fitness is also a testing tool. It allows uh, customers and QA people to define acceptance tests in the form of pages. Now, if you are used to a testing environment, you know that tests typically have setups and teardowns. In this tool, those setups and teardowns are on different pages. So the job of this code is to take every test page and then find all of the setups that are appropriate and prepend them and find all the teardowns that are appropriate and upend them and then take the whole thing and generate HTML and feed it into the testing engine. That's what this is supposed to do. So this function appends setups and teardowns to a test page. What was the name of the function? Testable HTML. Terrible name for a function, by the way. That's a noun. You don't want nouns as function names. Function names should be verbs because functions do things. Now let's, let's look at this function a little bit more. There's quite a few bad things going on in here. Let me read a little bit here. Let's see. Um, we've got this nice thing right here, that first line, wiki page. And if you're a programmer in this environment, you see that and you kind of heave a sigh of relief because the wiki page is the highest level abstraction in this system. It gives you a great comfort to know that you can recognize that first line. The next line creates a string buffer. So now we are going from the highest level concept in the system to one of the lowest level things in a Java program. This is rude. The programmer is being rude. The programmer is taking you from the heights to the depths in the span of one line. There's a fundamental rule for a function. And the rule is that every line of a function should be at the same level of abstraction. And that level should be one below the name. What's happening here? Well, look, I mean, heck, he goes to the, the wiki page first and then to the string buffer, so up and down, and then he goes to a, a slightly high level thing, this page attribute, and then he's got an if statement, another wiki page, that's nice and high level, page crawler, that looks like it must be high level, oop, there's a null check, that's pretty low level, isn't it? And you keep on reading down and you get to here, a dot. Is that dot important? Does that dot have to be there? You're the programmer trying to understand this code, what is the meaning of that dot? We've gone from the highest level concepts to a dot. This is rude. Now, why is the code written this way? Well, the code is written this way because this is how you write code. When you are writing code, your brain does this oscillation from high to low level. And it works like this. You, know, you sit there and you're writing the code and you think, all right, I'm going to need a wiki page. All right, get the wiki page. Okay. Uh, I'm going to need a string buffer. Okay, string buffer. Okay. Uh, better check something. All right, if statement. Oh, it might be null. Check for null. Okay. Uh, this is the way your brain works, right, as you're writing the code. So as you're writing the code, you are, of course, creating this code that goes up and down the abstraction levels, which is rude. Not to you, the author, but to the reader. The mistake that the author here made is that the author got all this working and then didn't fix it. So let's continue. We've got all this up and down stuff, and you can kind of see that pretty obviously. I want you to focus, though, on this null check, which is followed by a page crawler, which is followed by three appends. Null check, page crawler, three appends. Oh, look. Null check, page crawler, three appends. Ooh. Null check, page crawler, four appends. What's the extra append? Who is that line end? Is that line end important? Does that line end have to be there? No check, page crawler, three appends. This is very clear what the programmer did here. The programmer got the first quarter of this working. And then like any good programmer, he did a copy, paste, and he fiddled that part into working. Copy, paste, he fiddled that into working. Copy, paste, he fiddled that into working. Perfectly normal way for a programmer to behave when they're trying to get it to work. He just didn't go back and fix it. 
He left it in this intermediate working state. Now, by the way, the author very well could have been me. Um, it's not unlikely that I wrote this code, although it's possible someone else did too, so I'm not claiming authorship of it. But I do claim that many years later, I saw this code in fitness and thought, oh, this is ugly, I should fix it. So I started to refactor it. Let me show you the, an intermediate refactoring. This is not the final refactoring. It is just a refactoring that, oh, is about halfway through. I'll give you about 10 seconds to look this over. What's that do? First of all, did anybody notice that the original function was completely surrounded by this if statement? It was, but it was kind of buried. It's very hard to see in that original code. Here you can kind of see immediately. It's, it's all about this if statement. So most of this code doesn't get executed unless this is a test page. Take a look at that if statement. The if statement's fascinating because it uses a variable. The variable is called is test page. Now is test page is defined right above it. This is called an explanatory variable. The only purpose for that variable is to explain what its contents is. And the contents is what you would have put in the if statement. Page data that has attribute colon test. Well, I think it reads a lot better to say if is test page. This is one of the ways you get code to read like well-written prose. You construct well-written prose from the names of variables and functions. Now, if you read further, we get the wiki page, fine. And we get the string buffer, so we're still going up and down the abstraction hierarchy a little bit. That's, that's still bad, but okay. After that, we include the setup pages, we append the content, we include the teardown pages, we set the content and convert it all to HTML. It's not very hard to understand what this code is doing. Still some problems with it. It's got a much better name, render page with setups and teardowns. That's better. Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe it should be render test page with setups and teardowns, but okay. Looks like a pretty good name, reasonable structure. Things are getting better here. Why is this better? What makes it better? Why is it easier to understand? It's smaller. That's the reason. You don't need any other reason beside that. It's smaller. And if smaller is better, well, let's turn that knob up to 10. Let's make it really small. Here, let me show you where it finally ended up. That's the final refactoring of this function. Render page with setups and teardowns. If it's a test page, include the setups and teardowns. Convert it to HTML. It takes you no time to understand this function. 